All right, hello everybody. It is my pleasure today being Rob Rutman with DotFit to be able to interview, spend a little bit of time with one of my mentors and with uh, one of many of you that are out there as well. A lot of my friends as well, we, we grew up with this person, but it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Purvis. Uh, Tom, honestly, I, I tried to even put together somewhat of all the things I, I, I got to read this, though. It's not even something that I want to botch, but there's so much more to this. But I just say, obviously, being an accomplished physical therapist, owner and founder of many companies such as Focus on Fitness, RTS, consultant with some of the biggest top equipment companies in the world, such as Nautilus and Cybex, uh, a big one that I can't wait to go into a little bit later on, but being the face of Bowflex for so long, uh, being on the editorial advisory board of countless journals and magazines, keynote presenter for conferences all around the world. Uh, and, and I say again, personal highlight, you were my instructor from when I did my NASM course. And for this for this interview, I dug this thing out as well, which, you know, I think it was done in 96 or 97, uh, but being my NASM instructor. So there was nothing better than when I got to learn from you right out of college. That and then all of a sudden I see you on TV. Man. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said that paper's so old, it's written on parchment. It's like nope. part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is. You'd be amazed with some of the stuff, right? But it was so great to be able to uh, see one of my mentors and idols actually on TV as well all the time. And obviously, this is all before the internet, you know, so we're going, holy cow, that he, he taught all my NASM. This is great. So, so much more, but I, I really do appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I know you're busy. And as we were just talking offline beforehand, but still being able to work with clients and running all your education that you do. Uh, but, but as you said to me, you go, I don't know exactly what we're going to talk about. And I said, I've got a nice little list here of some stuff that I really want to bring to light for a lot of the people that may not know out there, you know, how big of a role that you played and continue to play. But if we could start here, Tom, because, because I don't know this, I'd, I'd love to find out myself. What led you into physical therapy? What, what got you into that study? And, and when was that? Was that something, you know, right out of high school, going to college that you said, I wanted to do that? Or was that no, later? I had a couple of things I was interested in, all, all body related and honestly biased towards exercise. Um, I don't know. I just kind of fell into physical therapy. Quite frankly, back then, there was no kinesiology department. There was certainly no exercise science department. So if you were interested in exercise, you were going to a physical education program. And the last thing I gave a shit about was volleyball. Okay. To use that as simply one example. Now all the volleyball players in the world are mad at me, but it's simply an example. Um, so I chose physical therapy almost by default in that there really wasn't anything else that to, well, at all, and, and certainly nothing that went into the depth that they did. And um, the th great part about that is I used to tell people when I do lectures, I'm a recovering bodybuilder because at that time I was competing and it was such a dichotomy, such a diverse exposure to exercise because over here I'm trying to literally kill myself, whatever you know, for a brief period, whatever Joe Weider said, I'd try. And it became very apparent very fast that that was all BS. And then... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? I Sorry. Know, don't start crying, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and the other side, the part was great, though, was I was having to impart, dispense, if you will, exercise to people that couldn't do anything, started out in an acute care <clears throat> hospital, meaning, you know, and it was a state hospital. So talk about having a variety of exposure to things, everything. But the, the thing was, I was, my whole day was filled up with, I've got people that can't do a single thing I ask, not one of the protocols from physical therapy, nothing. And then over here, I'm going to go in and do my 400 pound front squats and hope for the best. And so um, that the bipolar set of exper exercise experiences framed everything I'm doing now. I didn't know it. Nobody knows at the time how important something's going to be later, um, especially if you don't dismiss it. I see that all the time education. People have an exposure to something, and 
they may go, oh, it's hard, or I don't see value in it, or that's not what I like. And then they don't file it away. They dismiss it, and they miss out on what it offers them in the future when it can actually pay dividends. And so anyway, I felt blessed. I feel blessed now. I hated physical therapy school. I fought with the teachers all the time. They would say stuff, and I was like, that doesn't make sense. Explain it to me. Sometimes they would. Sometimes they could. Sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they couldn't. And so it was really, really a great um, I learned some stuff about how to teach from probably more of the people I didn't like as teachers. And it just to make a, my, I always say to make a long story way too much longer, um, there's kind of an answer to your question. And that's framed so much of what I, what I do and the spectrum of, of people through which I enjoy working. But the big thing is, as kind of an attempted conclusion of that, people want to. Everybody out there, and I'm going to say everybody, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. People like to put you in a box. Now, you know this. Someone goes, what do you do? I refuse to tell anybody what I do. Number one, it's not possible because on a given day, I've got commercial real estate. So I might be the janitor for my tenants if there's a leak in the roof. On another day, I'm working with, I've got a, I've got a patient right now who's turning 100 uh, on the 21st. That's an interesting experience working with him. And by the way, COVID almost killed him from sitting on his butt, not from the stupid virus, because he was incredibly active. Goes to work four hours a day still, 100 years old, 99, That's sorry. Amazing. And then I've got people over here, kids, 15, that are tolerant of everything you do. So you want to try to put me in a box and say, oh, I never liked physical therapists. Oh, they don't know anything. Oh, that, what, I, I, that's a mistake to do with anybody. Very rarely is someone's entire set of experiences limited by a title. You know exactly what I mean. Whatever you started doing, you may still be doing, but the vast array of things that now encompass your day, your week, your month, and your year, you cannot be pigeonholed, can you, Rob? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. there you go. Yeah, no, amazing. And, and unfortunately for what you're saying, I know firsthand because I went to school Loved, you know, I got bitten by um, the bodybuilding bug. I'll never forget. It was uh, 1987, just because I remember that year when Lee Haney won the Olympia. You know, that's how we think of crazy things. And when I went to school, though, I, I wanted to be, and I went, I double majored being a, for PE. I wanted to be a PE teacher, but I also did exercise science. And then I'm the first to say, and I say this anytime I get a chance to set the tone for a presentation, learned a lot of great information, but my gosh, if I didn't have a room full of exercise testing equipment that was probably looked at back in the 60s, and then all of a sudden I got a client after that, I didn't know what to do. So I, I come out of there with, you know, with a piece of paper but again, working with a client, there was no exercise instruction. So, you know, for, for me being introduced to you and to like Neil Spruce with Apex at the time to, to really uncover what really goes on between, you know, how do you put on lean body mass or how do you lose body? I mean, Tom, we didn't learn one thing about any of that in school. Never mind, like you said, I mean, I had biomechanics and kines and, but it was never relatable. It just wasn't. And uh, I think that was one reason why, my gosh, when I graduated and then was exposed to you and NASM at the time, it was a match in heaven. I was like, this is what I wish I studied for more than four years and kept going on. So, well, think about this. We get some degree, piece of paper, the higher the level of degree, the more we think we know. And it's always a facade. Number one, anybody that gets their CPA will tell you they don't learn accounting until they get out and start doing it. And that's when all the real problems arise. So it's, it's very similar to that. That's why they don't, you know, you're, you're an MD, you're, a, you get through medical school and then you start your education. If you're going to be a surgeon, you're doing years of surgery before they unleash you upon the, you know, <laughs> poor, poor patients. But, um, so you're learning exercise or about, uh, you're learning about exercise when you're in school from professors who've never done any exercise instruction themselves for the most part, and especially back in 1987, yeah. nine, whenever you were in school, 
early thousands, and people go, oh, I had a great professor. That means you liked them. That means they could tell you research. Show me that they know how to teach any exercise to someone who's never done an exercise. Show me they know how to progress motor learning. Show me they understand the forces and whether or not someone should even be participating in those or not. Because traditionally, we learn, I think of it like a pill. We're going to dispense pills. Oh, you need to do a bench press for chest. It's like, wait a minute. That's, we made be up bench presses. That's a sport. That actually is not, you know, we get to argue about specific exercises. But the fact that we dispense these things as if they're for everybody is annoying. And that is the best we got in school. Now, you learn what mitochondria did in endurance versus strength. And you figure out how to, how to uh, instruct exercise. You, there's not a damn thing you can do with knowing about a mitochondria. You can't invite them to happy hour. No. Marry one. You can, I guess now you can marry anything, but, which is fine with me. I don't care. But the whole thing is school is really important for marketing yourself, really important for getting a baseline level of information, because the number one thing that I see when people come to my classes, everybody wants to talk about exercise from an advanced point of view, and they cannot communicate. They do not have the language. Language is not just words, as you and I both know. Language is the meaning of the words. I can't just get a bunch of Italian words and throw them out there. Somebody's going to shoot me for that, right? Because I'm. what did I say? So if someone wants to talk about exercise, they have to have, first and foremost, an exercise mechanics vocabulary and understanding because the exercise is mechanics. It's not sets and reps. You have to have the exercise before you do sets and reps. It's not, you can't stimulate a mitochondria until you build the exercise. And that's the number one problem with most exercise related research is they haven't controlled the variables of exercise. So you and I both know what happens when you don't have controlled variables in research. So um, it's really, 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 really interesting what you said, but consider who offered you information and what they did or did not know they can't teach you what they don't know. They can't even, even if they know it, if it's not part of the current curriculum, it's not their job officially. So there's a really interesting, and I think this is important and I'm harping on it forever. I hope you have six hours set aside for this thing. I'm good. <laughs> but uh, because it's certifications are falsely empowering. You take a test, it's a minimum requirement. You're passing the bare minimum of what's required to get a piece of paper. You go to school. And even if you rock that thing and you graduate cum laude and you're awesome, that doesn't mean you know anything about my 99-year-old client. You're not going to plug him into a bench press. You're not going to have him do front squats. And I loved front squats. Mm -hmm. I just thought back then, everybody should front squat. Obviously, that was incredibly naive. But we see it all the time. Social media has made it even worse. Training trainers has become more about here's what I do as if everybody should do that. And trainers should be focused less on what they do and infinitely more on what the other person needs. And those two things almost never have anything to do with each other. Even if you have the exact same goal, and I've been doing this for 10 years and I have a specific motor capability, a skill of, there's skill in everything. There's skill in an arm curl. There's skill in, just watch, most people don't have the skill to do it. They're flopping around like dead fish, live fish out of water, that's what I should say. But this idea that we really don't, we think, oh, no, no, I, I progressed them. I used less weight, and, I, and we, did, um, we did less sets. It's like, but you didn't progress the exercise. You progressed all the stuff that occurs after you've built the ideal exercise for them. What are their orthopedic tolerances? What are their neurological tolerances? And the idea of even doing an exercise assessment independent of the motor learning associated with actually doing that activity and that someone teaches that at a master's level in a college is infuriating to me because you think about this you take somebody and you're going to do mistakenly a bench press test well spend a couple of weeks teaching the guy the bench press with virtually no weight maybe even a broomstick and you get a different outcome than you did just throwing him under the bus so you're never really testing what they can do you're mostly testing what they can't in terms of ability so, you know, this industry, I, I set me off and I'm just, you know, word vomit because <laughs> I've only spent 30 years doing this and, um, and uh, the frustrations are, are pretty much only getting worse. There's less and less required 
I read a thing on, you know, uh, top 10 jobs in the future, and they always say dumb things. Um, like they used to say, physical therapy is number one. When the schools were saturated, when everything was saturated, you couldn't find a job. It's like, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great job, except you can't get in. Their speculation was everybody's going to get old and need therapy. Well, and also they're going to need an insurance to pay for you, and that doesn't exist anymore, or, you know, one visit. Anyway, so they were talking about you should look at becoming a personal trainer because the bar is so low to gain entry. Facebook, you get on there and they find out you have anything to do with this and they go, hey, who is that mask man? I just had to, Rob said he was, <laughs> so I had to come in. And I, I'm just listening for the last couple of seconds. I go, that is the Tom Purvis I met and I fell in love with. You know, I mean, without a doubt, Tom, you're the reason that I bought NESM back in the day. You know, you are that guy that challenged tradition and you got everybody just sort of thinking about, you know, you've got everybody just, you know, sort of thinking in a different direction, you know, and, and, and locked all, certainly all my guys in. And we, we built an empire off that in the very beginning. Well, it was really interesting. I was telling, Sorry, I was telling I somebody that. earlier today that the first time I heard the term, now. yep. I was telling somebody earlier today that the first time I'd heard the term gym science was from you. And <laughs> in Oklahoma, we call that stuff bullshit. So I never That's knew right. any words like gym science before. So it was really, really great to be in that, that uh, company. I don't mean that ink. I mean the cohorts we had. Yeah. Well, you and, started, I mean, you started it. Basically, you were in the SM. And that's the reason I, you know, when I first saw it, I was just like kind of wowed. Right, because you kind of broke tradition of the kind of the stuff. And, you know, I grew up a bodybuilder, so the only thing I ever knew how to do was lift heavy shit. Right, so it was completely different. And then, you know, listening to you, and then we got everybody involved with that. You know, so we we really we really put something big together, and it's just, and it keeps going. So it's something you should be very very proud of. Well, I was very really blessed that back in '89, when uh, Bob Goldman was preparing for the first one, October of '89, I met him at the. Uh, Joe Weider bodybuilding summer camp where I'd been working for several years during the summer. And um, yeah, I just started, I walked over, he's sitting at a table by himself at lunch and I just walked over and started complaining about <laughs> like I always do. Why do we do this? This is so stupid. You're teaching a personal training thing. People need to know this, this, this. He goes, all right, come talk. And I'm like, really? <laughs> that was pretty, I think he just wanted to fill spots. He was like, how many people can we shove in to 10 minute spots across two days? I think that's why he invited me. He had an extra 10 minutes to fill. But yeah, and then, then the next thing that was crazy was um, afterwards I said, we got to have a hands-on. We got to do this. And he said, do it. And I was like, holy crap again. It's like, well, okay, watch out. You know, for better, for worse, we're going to do something here. And so, the first to ever do hands-on was you guys. I'm telling you, it was a five-day course. And even me, because I, you know, growing up in the gym world, I can't send my guys for five days somewhere, right? You know, but, but when that started, it became a cult. You know, you guys had just put this cult together because anybody that walked out of that room was, after five days, was done, right? I mean, they were cooked, ready to go. And so that's when I've heard about it. And it started coming into me and I'm going, okay, what's all this NESM stuff, right? Well, and then that, was the that was the beginning of our relationship. Yeah. Well, we had some phenomenal presenters. I mean, certainly it was great being in the inaugural course and having some uh, influence on supervisory and developmental. But John Bleverneck was one of the very first people to ever talk about the word stability. And people looked yeah. at him like, what does this have to do with losing fat? And he's like, and, but it was, and he, he, before a lot of people, before a lot of people, he was out there, one of a handful discussing that. And Mitch Simon was phenomenal uh, in the stuff he did. So there really were, and I just, I don't just mean smart, but I mean smart and great at teaching and presenting. And those are two different things. You can be a charismatic presenter, but can you break it down and teach it? A lot of presenters just slap people with information and go, see how smart I am. And it's like, that's not teaching. Neil, you're a teacher. You're a certified teacher. You know this better than I do. You should be talking. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, listen. When yeah, I was when uh, Rob had reached out, he said, I'm, "I'm trying to get a hold of Purpose, right?" And I go, "You better find him, okay? You know, because you know, such a huge part of my roots is you. You know, and I'm just a big fan. Always been a big fan. And so I was hoping that uh, Rob could track you down to do this little interview there. So we. When well, he contacted the state penitentiary. 
And so they're letting me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you guys get back to it. I just had to say hi. And by the way, you look amazing. I mean, you look exactly the look same. Look at this gray hair, man. What is this gray hair? <laughs> I have more gray hair, but I color mine. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm afraid to color mine because if you stop, I'm afraid, you know, that I'll look like uh, completely white, you know? Yeah. So I'd rather just do it gradually. Here's how I do it. Here's how I do it. So a little secret for you, and I'll walk out. One, I have it, I, I call it a cut and shine. Give me some shoe polish. Put it in there, right? And it last, and I let it grow back out. I get it cut short with the color. And then I let it grow out for three months, and I'm basically my real color by then in the long. I have two different looks, <laughs> completely different looks. So is it kind of like a, is it like a skunk when you do that? You color well, it and then you get <laughs> Actually, I'm pretty gray all the way, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you, Dan. It was great to see you. Awesome. I'm just, I'm real proud of you, you know. You Thank just, you. You're still just doing some great things. All right. We got it. We got to do you know, like once every two years, we got to get together and just tell old, you know, war stories or something. For sure. For sure. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for everything. That was awesome. That was awesome. And again, for like our viewers out there, if you can get an idea, my, my two mentors growing up, you know, in the industry, I was lucky enough right out of college to be exposed to first Neil with Apex, which then led me to NASM and being taught by yourself and going through. So uh, but you guys actually touched on quite a few things in there. And, and I'll tell you what, that's something where I think, you know, you really did make a name Be, beyond your viewpoints, your opinions, the way you would back up what you would say and so forth. But Tom, I think hands down, anybody that's ever seen you, whether they liked you or not, I think everybody would agree, though, you're one of the best presenters and teachers that's ever been out there. And, and I say that because I go back and sometimes I get upset about, again, when I went to school and, you know, I had people literally that were, you know, again, to date myself, but I'll never forget A and P one and two going into class, the teacher would lay down overheads and we would just take notes on what was on the overhead. And that was what they spoke, you know? That's what an overhead is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, can you even imagine nowadays that would have just been an email, but instead we had to physically write everything that was going on. So there was things I was more interested in versus others, but obviously as we talk about learning, if you're interested and you make it interesting and you make it pertain to what we're looking for, you know, it changes everything. But, but like you said, between yourself and, you know, and I actually, I brought up John Believer Nick the other day, because I was thinking, I always remember him walking around with the balance boards and everything else. And, you know, look where we are with balance training nowadays, that kind of thing. But, you know, he was out there and of course, you know, Lenny Parasino and John McDermott and Bobby Capuccio and all the people that kind of came after you doing that just uh, an amazing time. It, so, was, uh, it was only another life or two ago. Yep, yep. Now, hey, in my notes though, I did wanna go back because, you know, again, it was what got me into it. And I think you've alluded to it as well. And then looking at your website, I saw some amazing pictures. And I mean that too, there's some pretty cool stuff on there with the beard and being 270 and everything else. Tell us more about your bodybuilding career, because I know I know you competed and you did very well, and I you know and there's a lot of other stuff that came from that, but it seemed like that also opened up doors, like you were saying with Neil, you know, being at Joe Weider Muscle Camp and everything else. What was what was the love of bodybuilding or the attraction of bodybuilding? How did that intermix with all of this? Well, that's for me where it all started, and I I don't know why I really don't. Um, one of those things, maybe other people have the same deal where it's just, you can't not do it. People would always say, <clears throat> you know, how, how do you go to the gym every day when you get off work? And I was like, it's the only reason I get up in the morning. This other crap is just what I have to live through to get to the gym. And, <laughs> and um, you know, we were overtrained and everything else, but um yeah, I can't, I can't answer that question because I don't know why. I just know that it, I, it never was out of my head. And there's a couple interesting things if I can attempt to stay on track for once in my life. Um, I wasn't great at all. I was a tall, skinny kid. I was 6'2". So and it, it became really apparent I'd have to weigh three to make a dent because at, as a heavyweight, the only national thing I went to was a junior USA. 
And all the other heavyweights, they were 5, 8, 9, 10. You know what I mean? And my same weight, two, whatever, 25 or whatever I was competing at. So it was like, all right, this is not for me. Um, like a lot of people, I had a couple decent body parts, but that doesn't make a bodybuilder. Well, actually, back in the 80s, it did. It went a long ways. But, <laughs> but back, you you know, were so I could say there was a handful of years of competing. And um, I remember this day where I went, all right. I'm not, I'm done with this competing stuff, but it didn't change that I wanted to be better for me. And at some point, that's the big day. I remember a guy who stopped training because he wasn't getting any bigger. And I was like, dude, you look phenomenal. You know, you got one of those picking up girls bodies. They love it, right? So why would you quit? So he starts riding a bike. Riding a bike's great, but it's like, it's not the same thing. Maybe for him, it satisfied the same thing. But um, I couldn't imagine quitting. So I started asking myself, okay, I know I, listen, wake up call. Nobody works out their whole life and ends up 4,000 pounds of lean muscle and negative body fat. And I know we just said two things are not possible, but think about it. We literally live our workout lives as if we're going to keep making progress. We're going to, we never once entertain the idea that we're going to stop making physical progress. And when that hit me, which was years after I stopped competing. I mean, I walked around at 245 all the time. That was just like a, eh. Um, I said, then what am I doing here? And the cool thing about it, I'm going to talk about another relatively serendipitous thing, and most people probably wouldn't say this. From the way I was doing things, from the amount of weight I was attempting to move, and it fairly controlled, but I came to find out control was not remotely what I thought it was. I was pretty beat up. Um, shoulder, knees, knees were always killing me, always, always, always. And I'm not going to blame front squats because one was infinitely worse than the other. And so they both survived. They both went through the same thing. So you can't do the childish thing of, well, that's a bad exercise. No, 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 no. First and foremost, it's about forces. It's about you. It's about whether you progress it. It's about how you perform it, how you decelerate. It's way more difficult than that, especially for someone pretending to be a professional to discuss exercise. Um, but I said, you know what? I got to figure out I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. I won the state contest. I'm a physical therapist. Everybody in the gym asked me questions because they either liked that I won the state thing and I have a stupid bowling trophy where they unscrewed the bower and put on a bodybuilder. That's all those stupid things are, guys. And then I'm a physical therapist, so I must be the genius of working out. Then why am I so torn up? Why was I beat up? And everybody I know that's my age or younger is, you know, DMSO and all this stuff and biceps tendon repairs and all these things. And it's like, that doesn't have to be a side effect of being great or being good, or it certainly has nothing to do with health. So as I was trying to figure out the human body and how this thing really worked so that I, I had this, th these two shifts, number one, I was never going to get better. And if I wasn't careful, I wouldn't be able to work out again. And I was going to definitely get worse. Number two, I realized that maintenance is progress. Everybody that quit did this. If I could just stave off the inevitable deterioration, I'm going to be 60 and all right, and next year 60. So this is going to be okay. So I started with the body. In the beginning, it was about lifting the weight. Move weight. Still the mindset for most people, the vast majority of people, unfortunately, the vast majority of trainers. And I realized one day, I'm actually more concerned about my body, either improving it or, or, or not beating it up. When I actually started seeing how the body moves, and I'm not talking about mimicking pitching, I'm talking about how the body moves. It's internal function, not a made up external function, the internal function of the body. And realized that every movement we perform, be it a squat or whatever the heck, is really you trying to move your body and all the weight is for is to make that appropriately harder so that you stimulate some kind of response that we hope is positive. With that in mind, the weight became a tool rather than a goal. Moving it didn't matter as much as moving me in certain ways and that thing went along for the ride, but it didn't take long to realize that that direction of resistance, the form of resistance, all these things played physics-based factors, and I'm sorry, but exercise is physics. People go, no, it's physiology, but what is the stimulus? You know, everybody in outer, 
I'm going to give you an example. Everybody in outer space, what, all two of them? Everybody in outer space, their physiology is fine. Why do they change? Lack of physical stimulation. Physical means physics -al. Physical. So this is really important. And it's not memorizing words and sound bites and E equals MC squared or even simpler than that is F equals MA. Those, don't, those things don't matter. It's how to make it practical. And so when I started understanding joints as the key, the number one key, and that everybody's joints while being similar were different, especially across time, Nobody's symmetrical. There's not a single person with symmetrical joints, especially across time. Arthritis is not symmetrical. Osteophytes are not symmetrical. That is all a facade. I started changing the way I worked out, and I realized in the process about two years into this, I went, you know what? I like exercise more than I ever did. Number one, it doesn't hurt anymore. Number two, I can train or work on anybody as a client. And number three, it's all because I actually like the guts of exercise. I love the guts of exercise. As much as I love training, as much as I love, that was mostly a sensation. And then later kind of a, you know, I, I'm happy with the way I look on rare occasion. Most of the time I was just skinny. At 270, I was skinny in my mind. So, um, but when I really got into exercise was after bodybuilding. And it was about, I don't know a better word, the guts of it, what's inside of this thing? Well, it's this, it's this marriage of the orthopedics of the body and force. That's the exercise. And the way you design it and the way you execute it determines everything. It's not just lay down and do it. It's not here's the start and here's the beginning. Every single person needs to do a slightly different path of motion based not upon me, but on them. And that's a really interesting, and that's what led me to personal training, was that I was looking at them, and I was not dispensing, oh, everybody needs Motrin because they have inflammation. Oh, and I'm using that as an analogy. Everybody needs, it's like, wait a minute, I'm going to tear this thing apart and become the exercise version of a compound pharmacist. I'm going to give them exactly the proportions they need of things. When someone says the sound by full range of motion, I'm like, here we go. Let's talk about this. Define full range of motion. Is it how far your joints move? Is it how far you can control? Is it how far, does it, there, oh, there's a strength profile. You're not the same, same strength throughout any range of motion. You're not, all these factors. So, and how about progression? Are you telling me day one, my 99 year old client needed to move as far as he or she can move? Day one, we can't progress this stuff. These things are so childish, truly unprofessional. And I'm gonna piss people off and saying they're childish because there are immature minds that are believing these things and blindly following the sound bites. A mature mind starts to discriminate. And unfortunately, the world doesn't know what discrimination means anymore because it's relegated to one part of social issues. Discriminate means choose. It means look at the factors in front of you and I'm gonna decide for this individual on this given day, I'm gonna decide what I'm gonna do and it's gonna be a neat recipe for them and it's an investigation. Did it work? Ooh, I'm backing off. Hey, that wasn't bad. Being discriminating in what you impart upon someone in terms of physics and motion and instructions and the progression thereof is everything to what we're supposed to be doing. I don't see it in physical therapy. I don't see it in gyms. It's ridiculous. And right now, people go, oh, that guy's a great trainer. Well, I'm sitting here looking at him from across the gym and he looks like shit to me in terms of what he's doing to that poor lady right there. So he's following some protocol, he's following some stupid certification, and I'm sorry, but they're all pretty stupid in terms of what they, they, there's no customization. They don't even know the variables to customize. If that pisses somebody off, I'll prove it to you, come see me. I'll prove it to you 50 times a day. But what makes him so great in your mind, I would say to the manager of personal training, his schedule's full. I'm like, holy crap, that's it? His schedule's full? That's a successful trainer, independent of the outcome of those people over the long haul. People go, no, 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 she made a lot of progress in six months. What's she gonna be like six years from now? If it's not sustainable, it's not successful. And you guys talk about the same thing historically at Apex with food, right? Same idea, if it's not sustainable, it just is irrelevant. It's a bad investment. Everybody wants the uh, dot com, you know, NASDAQ thing going on when in fact it's it's going to crash at some point. So, hey, Tom, I know that life is as I get older as well is full of these. If I only knew this, then 
But what, what do you even visualize for, you know, you had your bodybuilding career of going through that at a younger age and then everything now that you put together, like you said, just even based upon movement and forces. And do you ever go back and think, gosh, if I only knew this stuff when I was lifting the real heavy weights all the time, what, you know, what could I have done? Or at least maybe hopefully you're not in a whole lot of pain right now, but you know, I, I know Neil, I mean, he always talks about it for what he did back in the day, you know, as a, you know, basically professional bodybuilder, you know, just his joints and everything from his knees to his shoulders, bicep tendon, everything else. Do you ever experience that too? And think, you know, man, what, 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 what would we have done? You know? Well, the, the problem is the benefit and the problem of being young is you can tolerate anything. That's the benefit. The bad side is you can tolerate anything and it never works out well. Because if you can do anything, even what your body's not built to do, listen, people can tolerate bull riding and there's no way anybody thinks that's good for you over time. Right. Right. So all this stuff, yeah, we could, we could do amazing things and often with a lot of weight. The question was always, how long can you do that? But that's no different than any high level NBA player. How long is their career? right? They're all injured at some point, if not almost the bulk of their career. <clears throat> There's little nagging things. There's big things we don't know about. So <clears throat> so much of it, I got to tell you, this is going to make people mad also. Training a professional athlete, you can be completely brain dead and train a professional athlete because they will tolerate anything you do. Your greatest goal is don't screw up their skill. And there's not a functional exercise in the world that improves the skill of dealing with the exact physics of a basketball at the exact distances on the court among all the crazy other nine people doing crazy stuff. So it's like, and you're gonna do what that looks like shooting baskets? Immature minds. I'm sorry it is. And I will prove that time and time again. So yeah, I'd love to do things different. I have no doubt that I would never have been better as a bodybuilder, and you said my career in bodybuilding, I'm going to call it my quasi hobby. Okay. But um, I would love to have and, and things you don't know about. When I was 14, I was wrestling and I tore a meniscus. Well, back then, long before arthroscopy, boys and girls, they took out the entire meniscus. Well, that lateral meniscus come to find out later in my life, holds 80% of your forces of your lateral side of your knee. Now I know the myofascial people say your bones are floating. They're not. If you look at an x-ray, there's space because it's called cartilage. When your bones are touching, it's because the cartilage is gone. And when you remove the lateral meniscus, it doesn't take long for the part that used to hold 20% of the lateral forces to wear down to nothing. So that's why they try not to remove meniscus anymore and they play around with synthetic ones. But the big thing, it didn't take that many years of front squats and everything else I love to do, leg presses with people on top and just <laughs> the dumber it was, the better for that lateral side to wear out. So in 1993, I was told I needed a knee replacement. Everything that's ever gone wrong inside of me has become an experiment. <clears throat> How long can I put off this knee replacement? It actually doesn't bother me unless I were to try to sprint or something, but it's all about manipulating the forces and how they go through the knee. It's not just about pushing. I wish I had known some of that back then. I don't know that I could have staved off what happened to that part of my knee, given that it was a surgical intervention that precipitated it. But certainly shoulders are probably the most precarious of joints. People say, oh, they're complicated. They're not complicated at all. There's very little going on there in all honesty. Certainly there's multiple joints, but the big thing is because it appears so mobile, we take it to the extremes. We want to accentuate the mobility. That's the single biggest mistake in a shoulder because it is over time intolerant. Everybody knows a hypermobile joint is a bad deal. It's pretty easy to create in a shoulder over time. And as it gets even slightly, slightly not seated perfectly, centrifugated into the joint, arthritis starts to show up. And it is so common. And if you x-rayed every person that's over 50 in a gym, that's been in a gym their whole life, I would bet probably with a degree of accuracy, that there are osteophytes in that shoulder that are ripping apart their shoulder, their rotator cuff and their biceps tendon. Wait, so wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me that kipping pull-ups are not like high on your list? <laughs> I have a few other physical therapy friends that go, 
with this, you know, uh, the popularity of that style of workout, boy, that has kept me in business longer than you would ever believe. I'm going to throw something out at you about that. <laughs> because one of the things that I teach is not to assume because it looks dumb, that it is dumb. There are a lot of things where people are throwing objects, and in that case, they're throwing themselves. It probably has less potentially degenerative forces on the cartilage of the joint than a lot of really slow controlled things. Now, the soft tissues may be an entirely different story because of the rapid deceleration and acceleration. So the forces of the tissues promoting that are going up exponentially. So I wouldn't look, I wouldn't be worried about joints in that version of an exercise as much as I'd be worried about soft tissue. And I don't worry about it anymore. I, you know as well as I did, I mistakenly, like an idiot, was Mr. Doomsday. This is bad for your shoulder. This is bad for your... You know what I realized? I don't care. Look, this is beyond what this sh person's shoulder can do. And the only reason you're trying to do it is because Joe Weider or some big guy said so. Why don't we live with what, in what they offer? That's simple. But that's not how you do the exercise. Ah, you're trying to live by the rules of an exercise as created by somebody who knew nothing about the human body. We passed that on forever. How about this person in front of you? They walked in with the rules and the rules are what's available to them today, but they have limited motion. Why? Well, they need to stretch. Oh my God, you still think everything's tight because it's a problem? Tightness is a problem. What if tightness is a protection? What if the reason they can't go all the way up is because of osteophytes, which virtually everybody over 50 has? So you start looking at these things, you start cramming osteophytes, bones first together, they just grow because force produces bone. So with, with the only, and I don't care what someone does to themselves, I absolutely don't, I laugh at that every day. We have a responsibility with clients and the number one thing that we could do to be safe is live within the ranges they bring us. If the tissue gets healthier, if the neuromuscular system gets in better control, if there's orthopedically more motion available, it will be allowed. We see that all the time by living within, you can do isometrics and improve range of motion. Don't tell me you have to go to extremes to improve it. So having said that, because of the continuum, there's also this other end, where for someone's activity, we might want to bust through those things. If they're willing to get hurt, I don't give a shit. So I can't say that there's not potential benefit to some of that in the short run, but we have to separate performance, external performance that we measure by numbers and weights and sizes and speeds and in distances from internal performance or internal function that dictates the world. It defines what's available out here. And the more we try to exceed the inside, the quicker it comes to an end. Now, we love that. We love trophies. We love the ego stuff. But I got to tell you, I don't know anybody who really enjoys not being able to walk without pain when they're 60. I don't know those people. And you know what? Their trophies are dusty and they absolutely don't care. And if they're still promoting their trophies, they need a psychiatrist. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Tom, one thing I was thinking about when you were answering the last question, too, is <laughs> I just wonder anyway, if you didn't run into some of those issues yourself personally, I wonder if you would have been so driven with, with learning and getting so deep into the body and proper mechanics. Because if you didn't hurt, maybe you would have been like, hey, it's not me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't experience that, that type of thing. So maybe it was almost a blessing in disguise where that led you into a, 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 an amazing career path. It was beyond a blessing. And I, I say that over and over. Think about this. When you were sitting in a class I was teaching, one of two or three going on that particular month across years, there was not a soul, I bet, I bet, there was not a soul, given the age and activity level of the people in that class, uh, there was not a soul going, I do behind the neck pull downs all the time. What's the problem? I do behind the neck presses all the time. What's the problem? It doesn't hurt me. And the thing they need to do is it doesn't, it hasn't hurt me yet. We cannot predict that. And I'm not saying it will, right? You might die. You might get lucky and die before your shoulder gets messed up. That was kind of a joke. But um, yeah, so if I could do to this day everything I ever wanted to do, why would I explore it? Why would I sit back and go, what am I missing here? I'm supposed to be smart. Maybe I should try to be. Don't ride on the fact of, and so yeah, I became my own guinea pig. 
and my own reason for looking at these things. And then as a second, listen, my knee changed over time. My shoulders changed over time. The last thing I would assume is, number one, anybody else is not changing over time. I don't know what they did before they got here, internally, orthopedically, neurologically. But also, even if someone goes, here's a giant mistake. Oh, I have the exact same knee problem. I hear trainers say it all the time. Oh, I have the same thing. All you need to do is this. There's no such thing as two things being the same thing. There's not one diagnosis that's exactly the same in two people, right? So you could have, you could have two different people with completely torn ACLs and two completely different levels of instability. And some might be able to sustain that given their current activity level and some can't walk virtually. So this idea that, oh, I hurt my shoulder too, really, which one of the 150 things is wrong with your shoulder and then to what degree? So yeah, those, those kinds of awarenesses. And then most importantly, you and I started this whole conversation before you push the button about practical application and that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter what we know if we can't apply it for the individual. It doesn't matter how much stuff we can spout. It doesn't matter how many tests we pass. It doesn't matter what we've memorized. It doesn't matter what trophies we have. I believe all of those things matter. There is a tremendous value to knowing the terminology, to knowing what's going inside the body, and that does not make you a good trainer, but it makes you able to communicate and learn. If this person that's incredibly book smart doesn't go in the gym and struggle with stuff, and I don't mean struggle with weight, you can't teach something you haven't struggled with. This was a big um, thing I figured out. It's like, listen, everybody that walks around with abs while they're eating ice cream all day long, they're probably the last person you want to learn how to get abs from. They're probably the last person that will be able to help you with your mental struggles with this thing, your emotional struggles with this thing. So it's actually great to find something that you're not good at to go through the motor learning process, to feel inept, because that's where your clients feel. And that's so cool to do that. And I love the fact I'm constantly looking for what am I missing and what do I suck at? Because whatever I'm good at is irrelevant. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help me get better. And you can ride on what you think you're good at. Number one, nobody out there is probably as good as they think they are. And number two, it's all the stuff you're leaving on the table that you're not so good at that can change your life. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Hey, I want to I want to go to something that that you're definitely known for as well. That that again changed my life with a lot of other people with with my career path. But I'd love to know a little bit more of the origin and and where you thought this process up and maybe nailed it down to these six specific things. But those of any of you that are watching that are familiar with with Tom's teaching and again it was I pulled this out while he and Neil were speaking because this was my first NASM textbook and it's it's all in here as well is amazing but Tom you, you have your six steps to you know creating and monitoring an exercise and oh no you're shaking your head I hope that's not bad I mean that changed no, it's everything not bad, but it's kind of like asking me about something I did in kindergarten and how, no. how cool that line drawing of an elephant was Dude, that is so remedial and so gone. I'm glad it helped some people, but uh, holy crap. But Tom, you got to think back to the era we were in, right? Our education at that time, beyond going to school, which we already talked about what formal education there was there, was the freaking magazines coming out every month because the internet wasn't out. I didn't know where, I, I, I couldn't wait to get the next, next muscle and fitness to see so-and-so's chest routine, which was the same chest routine as the everyone for the prior years, just a little different uh, order of exercise, <laughs> right? But when you exposed a lot of that stuff, and again, like, you know, we talked about this off camera for a moment, but I know it sounds so, so elementary now, but it's just not because I get to deal with newcomers into the industry all the time, but the inner peck versus the outer peck, or like you said, I mean, my gosh, we'll open our eyes to maybe not everybody's going to be suited to do behind the neck pull downs. And, you know, I used to get responses back that it was for the upper back versus front pull downs were a different part of your back, right? I know you're, you're dying right now hearing that stuff, but that's still where a lot of people are today. And I think a lot of the education today almost just jumps over that. That, assumes they know that and then they try to get into such higher level stuff but that was the meat and potatoes and, and, and like I said to you I give you all the credit in the world I, I had a slide with your picture on it and everything but I was lucky enough working with a club chain for 10 years wanted to get back in the trenches kind of like what you were talking about though is I wanted to 
getting exposed to be book smart and sit in the ivory towers with apex and then nasm after that and i go i want to see if this stuff really works so i went back into the clubs as a fitness manager for a couple of years had to train a whole team had to had wow. to sell had to you know let's really administer this stuff and um and i taught your six steps and again always gave you credit but i mean it was and everyone their eyes were like mine 20 years before they, they don't get exposed to that and we assume that they just know that stuff but I, I, I know it's hard for you, but when, when did you come up with that and kind of nail it down to this a little bit more of a formal type thing? Because it is, it's a, it's a huge part of our history, all of ours. First of all, I don't remember what they were. So would you look at your book right there and tell me so that everybody knows we're all on the same page? We just, there's the names of, you You know them because you've- What's the motion, where's the resistance? Wait, wait, the first one's what? The first what one's what? I'm sorry. So it was, uh, you know, what's the motion of the movement? Let me see. I've got to look up uh, exactly where it is. So I'm not just flipping blindly through, but I know it was, you know, what's the motion that you're trying to produce, right? Where's the resistance coming from? And again, though, Tom, those were the days where people were grabbing the dumbbells and doing this and not to say that nothing's going on here, but primarily not the main thing. Right. But that was mind blowing. Right. So then if we know where the resistance was coming from, how do you position your body? And then it was uh, for monitoring the exercise was the stability and path of motion and range of motion. Okay, so this is, this is important to me. Number one, the most important thing, you are probably the only person in the exercise industry that teaches that gave credit for anything. So everybody should, should commend Rob for that. Thank you. Um, cause everybody somehow reads something and thinks it's their own. So as if nobody wrote what they read, um, I remember specifically trying to make things simple, literally and sitting in an office. I had just, I'd expanded my facility and the, there was not even carpet in it yet. That wasn't disgusting. And the wall was yellow cause they had sold baby clothes or something in this I hadn't broken through the wall yet. And I had stuff all over the wall because I like to see what the heck. And I was like, okay, what do we have to, what's the minimum things we could teach somebody to be a better trainer? And then I went, basically looked at, well, there's a giant list of potential issues. What could get them in the ballpark? So as I remember those first three things, number one, the motion. And I bet if you read, as things are popping in my head, I bet if you read motion, it talks about what's the goal right because you just did this one so yeah. what's the goal well that becomes important because if your goal is chest that's what the chest does oh dude i was putting together a presentation the other day and they were actually there was somebody doing this for chest with dumbbells as if they were as if they were in a cable crossover nice. and i was like oh my god and that's on you know the problem with social media and websites there's no limitation to the exposure of stupidity it's just everybody can say anything and if it looks good it must be right um, and that's another problem, followers. Oh, he's got 8 million followers. It's like, that doesn't mean he's right about anything. That just means a lot of people follow him, right? Somehow these kids think that followers means information. They think that a 350 pound body, well, look how big he is, he must know. Well, wait a minute, there was a 350 pound guy 10 years ago, so now he doesn't know because he's smaller and this new guy, he, the old guy forgot, come on. So how can we eliminate that most basic fundamental set of mistakes? How can we at least get them to where they're kind of accomplishing or challenging what they say they want to do, right? So it wasn't about, it was meant to be simple. It was meant to get us, well, I don't know how else to say it. This um, uh, position to get there. So there's obviously a flow, it's a flow chart in essence. What's this goal? Identify the direction of resistance. Now, what position do you have to be to get there? So the cable crossover thing, uh, wait a minute, I, if I've got gravity pulling down, I can't be standing up and get chest, probably I'm gonna have to do. So it was that decision making process. And I'm going to go back to for the last three steps. That's the trainer part. If you set it up, and it's not accomplished appropriate for the individual or, or maintained appropriately at all. Well, you're not a trainer, you're counting reps. You're, I don't know what they're paying you for talk about their dog or something. I don't know. But um yeah, so what are we, as a trainer now, what are we monitoring of those things? And it's interesting that range of motion is last on that list. I would struggle, I struggle with lists now because I could find an individual where I would flip some things around because of their issues. 
And so that, <clears throat> as soon as you make a list, you got to hope it works for most folks. But the problem is people take it like a law, a set of laws, like a constitution, and they don't sit back and go, guys, this is a very malleable thing based upon the person. And that's one of the biggest things I don't see out there. People saying on the social media, this is the way to do a squat. This is the way to do a bench press. And they'll argue over that. And it's like, number one, why are we doing a bench press? Who are we talking about? What's the goal? Who are we talking about? They're talking about themselves. Always. I got a friend and he said, you know what social media is? It's the, hey, look at me. Opportunity. It's never, it's rarely truly education. Um, and by the way, if it's free, if it's on social media, realize that I've known a lot of business people with hundreds of millions of dollars, and they pretty much live by if it's free, it has no value by definition. So although my grandfather says some smart stuff, and that was relatively free, so maybe that's not true. Um, but yeah, so monitoring that stuff, and um, I got to tell you, it's you're right. I'm wrong. You're, you're absolutely right. That is more poignant now than ever before <clears throat> because exercise is not just movement and this is not an opinion by the way does anybody out there do a plank it's not just movement is it your goal is to not move how are we so hypocritical that we can say it's all about movement and then the first thing we do is a plank it's like are you listening to what you're saying and watching what you're doing this is we better revise that because you sound stupid not you, but the people saying that. And so um, this thing is, is not, certainly there can be movement available, but why, why are you moving? What are you trying to stimulate? Because the direction of resistance is entirely in charge of the stimulation, as well as the type of resistance, the starts and the stops and all those things because they alter physics. And so, um, <clears throat> Is grabbing a weight and just moving just because it's, is it really accomplishing it? People say it's not about muscle. It's about movement. It's not about muscle. You ever heard the old Vern Gambetti quote, don't train muscles, train movements? Or maybe it was the other way around, train muscle, train motions, not movements, whatever. Train, mo stay away from muscle. It's bad. It's satanic. <clears throat> That's what they're trying to say. Here's the problem with that. I'm sure they were talking about don't try to work biceps, as if you could ever work biceps independent of brachialis and friends. But here's some interesting things. <clears throat> if you did a really strict curl, and I'm not saying you should, I don't care what you do, and I don't even know who we're talking about, and you're doing it strict, what is it that makes just the elbow move? What is it that makes it so only the elbow moves? You're holding everything else still. What are you using to hold everything else still? All the other muscles in varying degrees of challenge. How does this escape people? So I can hold my whole body still in a plank, and that's okay. I can hold 98% of my body still in a curl, and it's satanic. Think about the hypocrisy here. And again, people, when they hear me talk and use a, a, a examples, they think I'm promoting a specific exercise. I'm not because I don't have anybody in front of me. And I don't know who the goal is and I don't know uh, whatever. I've never had my 99 year old guy do a curl. Biceps are not on his you know, checklist. Yeah. So um, elbow flexors, I should say. So <clears throat> that's um, it's a huge problem out there is everybody's saying, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. This is good, this is bad. And oh, then there's one of the most popular guys on the internet saying that it's a myth. It's a myth that you can't. I've never heard of a negative myth. It's a myth that you can't work in or separate from outer. And he goes to a book and starts talking about non-spanning fibers. And people go, wow, that's cool. He's so smart. Unless you actually get off your ass, go read really difficult textbooks about non-spanning fibers. And there's no evidence that there's non-spanning fibers in the, in the pecs. There's no evidence. They, in fact, they talk about it would be impossible for these fibers. And there is lateral transmission. They don't have to go all the way in non-spanning fibers. This guy can pull them because he's stuck to these guys. He's pulling, right, through the connective tissue. But it's not about whether the fibers span or not. It's about what the motor units are doing. Because if this guy pulls and there's nothing to pull against, this guy can just lengthen. So they both have to pull to some degree. It's a biomechanical necessity. And by the way, anybody that thinks fascia can generate motion, um, then why can't quadriplegics move? Because their fascia is intact. So there's just about a million subjects. But the bottom line is this, this social media is a mess. 
People come into it. It's worse, it's worse, Rob, because we had less BS in our minds. There was less to deprogram. It was pretty much bodybuilding, and then it's little weenie derivative called group exercise. It was just bodybuilding exercises on a step, on a floor, or whatever. So now we've got every possible version of every piece of insanity independent of any consideration about who we're working with. And when someone does try to say who it's for, they use a general demographic statement. Oh, this is great for your 60 year olds. I have a gym full of nothing but almost exclusively 50 through 90 year olds. And not a one of them is exactly the same in their abilities the day they walk in. Not one of them. These generalizations make it not personal training. Personal doesn't mean, you know, necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. To me, it means it's very personal. It's customized. And so the problem with that, Rob, is that it requires a tremendous degree of intelligence and even more wisdom. And these people want easy. The bar is low. Any idiot can get into it. And the problem is there are brilliant people that got in it at the low bar, but because they haven't been stimulated, they're not aware that there is something else, they don't attain a higher level of understanding. And people go, oh, I've been doing that for 20 years. Yeah, but you look like you've been doing it for two months. So I wouldn't tell anybody you've been doing it that long because it's sad, you know? And, um, but that's just a huge thing. Some of the best people that we've had come through my incredibly difficult program they don't start with hard stuff, they start with the easy stuff. And typically, you know, there's a scene, you remember the Matrix, do you realize how old the Matrix is now? That's like gone with the wind old, it's that old, right? right. So there's a scene where, uh, what's his name? Uh, Fishburne is talking to Yo and Bill and Ted, right? Well, yeah, and, and he well, goes, do you know why you're here? So you have a splinter in your mind meaning he knows something's wrong. It just doesn't, you walk around the day and it just doesn't seem that we're missing something. Those people, no matter what little bar they jump through to get in the industry, that's usually the stimulus when, when they end up in my classes. They knew something was wrong. They almost never fight for that stuff because they knew there was something shaky about it. When someone's ego, identifies with what they learned. And they're so sure, and you can't even say, that might be, we need to reconsider that. Well, they take it as you're saying, we need to reconsider you, because they identify with this stuff. It's just information, take it all in, sift through it, figure out what, listen, nobody outside of the idiots that have favorite numbers, pretty much numbers are numbers. You know what I mean? So you take in all the numbers and you use them when you need them for adding stuff or whatever. Why don't we do this with general information? We just take an information and we go, I'm not sure it applies to this. Looks, this guy looks more complicated than that. I'm certainly gonna use what I've got, open the files, find it, and then try. Is it gonna work? I have people ask me all the time, is that gonna work for somebody, blah, blah, blah? And I'm like, here's what I show them. Hang on, don't go away. It's my favorite thing. Well, I have lots of favorite things. I go, I. Is it going to work for them? <laughs> uh, my crystal ball has been broken for so damn long, I don't know what to tell you. What's the only way, Rob, to find out if it's going to work for them? Try it. Try. Yeah. And try cautiously. Yeah. Cautiously. It may be fine, but it might not work because you hit them with a sledgehammer instead of tapping them and going, hey, this worked. All right, we'll do it. Oh, that worked too. Hey, this worked. Let's stop today because I already did three things you're not used to. It's just not that hard, but it's, you know what I'm saying. And I, I can just yeah. make anything ridiculously long and boring, <laughs> but it's an industry I love because of the clients, because of the people that really get helped across the long term. It changes their quality of life. And it's great to lose 10 pounds. And it's, it's certainly if you weigh 400, it's great to get that weight off your joints and your heart and everything else. But my God, I love working with people 50 and older, and that's not a hard, fast age. Anybody who's lost, significantly lost to them, what they had when they were younger, and they're like, I see where this is going. I have to interrupt this process. Those people are there for a reason. I don't care about motivation. Motivation is always external and short-term. These people are committed to not being the way their friends are when they're older. You know what I'm saying? committed to it. They show up, they do their job.
when it changes so much as we get older anyway, because I'm not too far from 50 myself. And, you know, again, and my wife and I, we, we had our daughter at a little bit of an older age. So we're older parents. And, you know, I, I still love bodybuilding. I love jujitsu, but I want to be around to be able to do things with my daughters. And that's the most important thing, you know, so I totally understand that. But you know, when, when I was bodybuilding and people used to say that, I'm like, okay, I get it. But yeah. and it ends up being, you know, you and I both know, people don't know my show, my TV references or movie references. There was a guy named Al Bundy that you and I will remember from. And the funniest thing about this guy, for those of you who don't know him, is a pretty much of a sad sack guy who sat around with his hands halfway shoved in his belt all the time. And he always, he frequently talked about this one game and this one pass. And I'm like, I got to tell you, whatever you're doing today, unless you're, well, I'm betting in 20 years, we won't know who Usain Bolt is. Whatever you're doing today will be insignificant at some point in time. I hope, because if you're still living in the past, you're missing all the good stuff. And so these people that get that, that I used to kind of not make fun of, but dismiss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll worry about that when I get there. Well, I don't, it, it ends up being your bigger goal than you ever had because it's bigger than just you. And most of our goals when we're 20 are just us, yeah. you know? For sure. Hey, Tom, I have kind of a, I don't know if it's a hard question or not, but um, maybe a, a little different one, but what would you now, you know, at, at your stage in your career and your life and everything you've been going through, if you could go back, let's say, you know, back to even not when you started, but even when I, when I met you, when you were teaching for NASM, but if you could go back to the Tom then, is there anything that you might provide as a little different advice for life advice or I don't know, I always love find, finding these things out from people like yourself. Is there anything now that you go, you know, hey, what would you tell this guy? If there's anything, there doesn't have to it's, be. It's the same thing. It's the same thing I try to tell myself every day now. And, and I'm pretty sure this is my final answer <laughs> to, again, quote a TV show that nobody remembers. But um, you ever heard somebody talk about someone that had a, near death or actual death experience and came back from it. If you've ever heard, heard those people give interviews and people, people will always ask, so what did you learn from that? How has it changed your life? The one thing that's fairly consistent among those people is, well, there's two things. Number one, I don't fear death. And number two is I'll never be afraid of anything again. Meaning all the hesitancy they had to accomplish or go after a goal. I still have that Rob inside of me is this, still, still thriving, cancerous, and it doesn't matter 14 years on TV, 24 hours a day all over the world for Bowflex. It doesn't matter anything I ever did because that's old. And anything I'm going forward, you would think, a lot of people think, oh, well, he can just go after whatever he wants. I can, but I don't always do it because there's this little Ego piece and ego just, you know, a lot of people are very familiar, but in case someone's not ego just doesn't mean doesn't mean you think you're great. Ego gets juice from anything. And if it can win by making you think you suck on a given day, it's all over it. Right. So I would go back and say, whatever you want to go after, do it unabashedly, do it wisely if you can. <laughs> but the last reason to not do it is because you think, because of fear. There's a friend of mine named Jay Blonick. I used to, he consulted with uh, Nautilus also, and he said, never make a decision out of fear. You know, there's times when people say stuff like that to me, and I'm like, I have got to, I have got to live by that. That doesn't mean because you hear a quote, you can. Usually my favorite quotes are ones I aspire to, <laughs> you know, um, not, because, not because I can do them, but um, yet. But <clears throat> I think that's a big thing. And I think that that there's a lot of people out there that, that would immediately recognize that in themselves. I think there's a lot of people out there who don't yet recognize that in themselves. Um, I think if you're happy with what you've done, you'll never recognize that there is something out there you might be afraid of. Uh, and I'm not saying stupid extreme sports stuff. If, you, if it takes extreme adrenaline for you to appreciate life, you're not looking around very clearly. 
because there's amazing things going on. The fact, think about this, the fact that we go to sleep, suspend all fear of dying and shut down with the complete and total faith that we're gonna wake up tomorrow. If that's not the biggest, that's amazing to me. That's amazing, you don't have to say, I'm so tired. It's like, we should be going, God, I gotta get so close to dying every night. I'm not going to sleep. I'm, I'm being kind of silly, but I'm also being truthful about that. There are things that I think wise people wouldn't do. And I think wise people appreciate the life they've been given enough to not challenge it in a way for a dopamine response. Um, and then they call that life. <clears throat> and that's, that's their lessons to learn or whatever the heck, or their family to miss them when they're gone for no reason. But <clears throat> um, yeah, I think that fear thing is really, 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 really interesting. And um, I think it's also, I never had trouble with this one, but if I was talking to my kids, that search for something you're passionate about, and I got to tell you, if you're passionate about something, it's not a search. And like I told you in the beginning, I never had to look for any of this. I taught myself to weld in 1980 because I wanted to build a squat rack better than what I could buy. Uh, and the next thing you know, I'm building a leg extension and it sucked, but it was better than the one we had with the plates on the top and the bottom. And there was all kinds of stuff. So I, I've dabbled in all these things, built houses, I mean, framed them and all kinds of stuff. And um, some things don't inspire fear in me, building things, being creative, but putting myself out there with the possibility of being wrong. There's only one way where I've come to do that. I know I'm wrong. I will find something tomorrow that I was wrong about today. The most powerful thing is saying, I don't know. And I wonder what I'm missing. Too many people don't ask, what am I missing? I think we mentioned earlier, I got to find that because that'll make me less wrong tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so those are a couple of things that I would say to myself, probably say to other people. Here's the final thing on that, though. The problem with going back and telling yourself something, did your parents ever say to you, or have you said it to your, you said you had a daughter? Yeah. yeah. So you know, she's at the age right now where you might say, why do you have to learn the hard way? Why don't you learn from what I'm telling you? Right. You know why? <clears throat> because learning from what someone else did is not learning. That's an attempting to transfer it. It's not real. We learn the hard way because that's experiential and it's the only way to learn. Hopefully, you're not learning whether the lawnmower is on by sticking your hand underneath it, although it would be experiential. It's nice when it's not that severe, right? But that, that learning the hard way is everything. And I think the reason I'm conscious of this fear thing now is because I'm learning it the hard way for the past 50, 60 years. And I don't know that there's shortcuts to learning. I think there's shortcuts called memorization, but memorization and intelligence are almost unrelated. People get off as of semi intelligent because they can memorize page numbers and quotes and all this stuff. Memorization does not generate problem solving. And IQ tests are not based upon anything but problem solving. Anyway, that's some junk. I love it. I love some awesome. There's a lot of great stuff in that that I very good. I'm, I'm really glad that I asked the question the way you answered that. But Tom, if you would, I, I still have a bunch of questions, but I know I want to be respectful of your time as well. But can you share with us um, anybody? And, and I, I tell you, if, if, if anybody knows me out there or, you know, you trust in us with DotFit and Neil and everything else, um, take the time, invest in your education. Tom Purvis is somebody that you want to do that with. Uh, but Tom, can you share with our audience, how can they, how can they get more Tom? And maybe what would be the, let's say the, um, uh, the order or the process that you might say, start here, then you can progress to here and so forth. Well, if they want to have a link to everything I'm involved with right now, they can go to tompurvis.com and there's some links on there and they can see the stupid pictures you were talking about too, if they're so inclined. <clears throat> um, but I long ago, I ended up with about 80 domain names that were of interest to me. And one of them was personaltraining.com. And as I was developing that <clears throat> over the past couple of years, I realized that I wanted, as we, as we talked about way back then, resistance training 
transcends careers. It's a modality, a tool used by lots of people. And I started searching out and acquired exerciseprofessional.com. So that is the platform that I'm currently, <clears throat> I'm not in charge of that anymore, but I am a content provider and a consultant and a, a board of director, I mean, on the board of directors and all that kind of stuff. But um, and there will be lots of content from lots of people on there. But the thing is, I was, I mentioned, I think before we went live, that my, what graduated into evolved into a 20 day course, five separate four day weekends or whatever. Um, <clears throat> two of those were entirely lecture based. And it's not just stuff from school. It's figuring out the realities of those things. And they're only things that are practical and they're things I've had questions about. That's how that grew to eight days, was questions that have been asked before, questions you have or should have had, and how the sciences can be interpreted as potentially helping that. And I choose those words very carefully. Potentially, potentially be considered, potentially help the things we're worried about. Because people are not great at applying science. They, they, see, they think they see direct correlations or, and a causation effect thing. And it's, it's not that easy. But um, that now, those 56-ish hours are now online so people can, the beauty of that is you can watch it over and over and over and over and over. And the beauty for me is when I update something, if it's something you've already purchased, it just shows up in your account. So I don't have to sit back and worry about you thinking in terms of my old information. If you want to see what I did yesterday, it's in there if you, if you already bought that subject matter. But I love that being able to evolve. And if someone wants to evolve with me, because people go, oh, I went to RTS. When? Uh, it was uh, 1999. I'm like going, wow, that's like saying I drove a car once. What was it? It was a Model T. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That didn't mean it was a, that didn't mean it didn't run. That just means that they've changed some like a lot. So there's a, 120 hours currently of um, lecture, if you will. There's no reason to fly and sit in a chair. If you fly, we should be in the gym all the time. So there's 120 hours, probably that's only probably two thirds of where it's going to go. And all of that will be the, the evolution of those two prerequisite courses. And those are required to participate pieces of that kind of like when you go to college and you're going to take whatever a 2000 level course, or you're going to get a minor in something there's certain number of classes ready, you know, required for that, not everything. And if you get to, you know, the full meal deal, it requires everything as a prerequisite. So it's laid out on RTS123.com. It tells that in order to get the most out of this hands-on experience, in order to really smash that sucker, this, this all certain um, classes, courses, whatever from that are required. And certainly we're not going to monitor that, but it's been so evident that people that come without that ability to communicate and see these things, they're lost. They're lost because it, it truly is only, I don't ever want to back up. One of the reasons I left NASM way back when, um, we had a course when Bob had it. When Neil took it over, we kept that course and then started a two day and then expanded, called advanced the thing that we'd had before. Well, I think we only did three advanced courses because it was not financially feasible. Once people get this two day thing, they think they know it all. It's cheaper. I got the thing on the wall. I'm good. Yeah. So, and I stopped doing the two day because I was just then, just then learning how to calculate shear. Back that year, it was shear this, shear that. People were saying shear. I was like, do you know how to define it? You didn't know how to define it. So I was consulting with engineers. I learned how to calculate it. And, and so, Wow, come to find out, guys, you know what moves every joint? Shearing forces. So why are we afraid of them? Oh, excessive. Like anything, excessive is not good. So, and I wanted to teach that, but it was so over even the advanced students' heads. And that course was on its way out because it wasn't, it was losing money. So I just said, I'm gonna keep doing this RTS thing I started a couple of years ago because I can just add days and I can just basically indulge myself, whatever I'm interested in, whatever I'm passionate about, I'm going to shove it in there. And somebody, somebody's like, well, nobody wants to know that. 
right now, all over social media, people are trying to draw arrows to analyze exercise. They're mostly wrong, the ones I've seen. But you know, when I was doing that 20 years ago, people were like, who cares about that? Everybody's, you know, and I'm glad nobody saw what I did 20 years ago, because I was mostly wrong. But, you know, um, so RTS, it's prerequisite stuff that's good by itself, of course, on um, exercise professional. And then there's a couple more things that are coming out. But I think that my personal website's the place. Any, the, anything that comes out, there'll be linked to that junk. So, you know, sure anyway, well, you want to do this again sometime and ask your other questions, I'll be glad to. I would love to because we mentioned it and I wanted to get into it because I, I love the stuff, but Bowflex and everything on I me, mean, it was amazing. But let's save that then, Tom, because I want to do it justice. I definitely do. But, uh, but man, I, I can't thank you enough. And again, for any of our viewers, you know, I mean, NASM has blown up in an amazing way. It's, it's worldwide. Um, those of you out there that are familiar with, you know, the OPT model and everything that's been going on, that would not be there if it wasn't for Tom Purvis. Who, I oh, guess, we have to talk about the OPT model next time also and how I would flip that upside down, but we'll talk about that. We can do that for sure. Hey, man, it was really great. I, I really do. I appreciate you taking your time today. And I had a great time going down memory lane. And, you know, again, <laughs> one of my mentors. So I, you, you don't know that I don't get to be as close with you as I get to work with Neil every day. But you had a huge impact on my career. And I know a lot of people out there as well. So thank you well, so much for doing what you do. Thanks for the opportunity, Rob. And uh, you're, you're great at this, by the way. You're great at stimulating thoughts and all that kind of stuff. And, and most importantly, in my case, you're great at tolerating me. So that helps too. <laughs> my pleasure. Thanks again, Tom. Okay, we'll talk really soon. It's a deal. Thank you. Take care now.